The Blighting of Sharkey by Arthur Conan Doyle Sharkey, the abominable Sharkey, was out again. After two years of the Coromandel Coast, his black bark of death, the happy delivery, was prowling off the Spanish main, while trader and fisher flew for dear life at the menace of that patched foretopsail rising slowly over the violet rim of the tropical sea. As the birds cower when the shadow of the hawk falls athwart the field, or as the jungle folk crouch and shiver when the coughing cry of the tiger is heard in the night-time, so all the busy world of ships, from the whalers of Nantucket to the tobacco ships of Charleston, and from the Spanish supply ships of Cadiz to the sugar merchants of the main, there spread the rumor of the black curse of the ocean. Some hugged the shore, ready to make for the nearest port, while others struck far out beyond the known lines of commerce, but none were so stout-hearted that they did not breathe more freely when their passengers and cargoes were safe under the guns of some mothering fort. Through all the islands there ran tales of charred derelicts at sea, of sudden glares seen afar in the night-time, and of withered bodies stretched upon the sand of waterless Bahama Keys. All the old signs were there to show that Sharkey was at his bloody game once more. These fair waters and yellow-rimmed, palm-nodding islands are the traditional home of the sea-rover. First it was the gentleman adventurer, the man of family and honor, who fought as a patriot, though he was ready to take his payment in Spanish plunder. Then, within a century, his debonair figure had passed to make room for the buccaneers, robbers pure and simple, yet with some organized code of their own, commanded by notable chieftains, and taking in hand great concerted enterprises. They, too, passed with their fleets and their sacking of cities, to make room for the worst of all, the lonely, outcast pirate, the bloody Ishmael of the seas, at war with the whole human race. This was the vile brood which the early eighteenth century had spawned forth, and of them all there was none who could compare in audacity, wickedness, and evil repute with the unutterable Sharkey. It was early in May in the year 1720 that the happy delivery lay with her foreyard aback some five leagues west of the windward passage, waiting to see what rich, helpless craft the trade wind might bring down to her. Three days she had lain there, a sinister black speck, in the center of the great sapphire circle of the ocean. Far to the southeast, the low blue hills of Hispaniola showed up on the skyline. Hour by hour, as he waited without avail, Sharkey's savage temper had risen, for his arrogant spirit chafed against any contradiction, even from fate itself. To his quartermaster, Ned Galloway, he had said that night, with his odious, neighing laugh, that the crew of the next captured vessel should answer to him for having kept him waiting so long. The cabin of the pirate Bark was a good-sized room, hung with much tarnished finery, and presenting a strange medley of luxury and disorder. The paneling of carved and polished sandalwood was blotched with foul smudges and chipped with bullet marks fired in some drunken revelry. Rich velvets and laces were heaped upon the brocaded settees, while metalwork and pictures of great price filled every niche and corner, for anything which caught the pirate's fancy and the sack of a hundred vessels was thrown haphazard into his chamber. A rich, soft carpet covered the floor, but it was mottled with wine stains and charred with burned tobacco. Above, a great brass hanging lamp threw a brilliant yellow light upon this singular apartment, and upon the two men, who sat in their shirt-sleeves with the wine between them, and the cards in their hands, deep in a game of piquet. Both were smoking long pipes, and the thin blue reek filled the cabin and floated through the skylight above them. 
which, half opened, disclosed a slip of deep violet sky spangled with great silver stars. Ned Galloway, the quartermaster, was a huge New England wastrel, the one rotten branch upon a goodly Puritan family tree. His robust limbs and giant frame were the heritage of a long line of God-fearing ancestors, while his black, savage heart was all his own. Bearded to the temples, with fierce blue eyes, a tangled lion's mane of coarse dark hair, and huge gold rings in his ears, he was the idol of the women in every waterside hell, from the Tortugas to Maracaibo, on the main. A red cap, a blue silken shirt, brown velvet breeches, with gaudy knee ribbons, and high sea boots made up the costume of the rover Hercules. A very different figure was Captain John Sharkey. His thin, drawn, clean-shaven face was corpse-like in its pallor, and all the sons of the Indies could but turn it to a more deathly parchment tent. He was part bald, with a few lank locks of tow-like hair, and a steep, narrow forehead. His thin nose jutted sharply forth, and near set on either side of it were those filmy blue eyes, red-rimmed like those of a white bull terrier, from which strong men winced away in fear and loathing. His bony hands, with long, thin fingers, which quivered ceaselessly like the antenna of an insect, were toying constantly with the cards and the heap of gold moidores which lay before him. His dress was of some somber, drab material, but, indeed, the men who looked upon that fearsome face had little thought for the costume of its owner. The game was brought to a sudden interruption, for the cabin door was swung rudely open, and two rough fellows, Israel Martin, the boatswain, and Red Foley, the gunner, rushed into the cabin. In an instant, Sharkey was on his feet, with a pistol in either hand, and murder in his eyes. "'Sink for your villains!' he cried. "'I see well that if I do not shoot one of you, from time to time you will forget the man I am. What mean you by entering my cabin as though it were a whopping alehouse?' "'Nay, Captain Sharkey,' said Martin, with a sullen frown upon his brick-red face. "'It is even such talk as this which has set us by the ears. We have had enough of it.' "'And more than enough,' said Red Foley, the gunner. "'There be no mates aboard a pirate craft, "'and so the boatswain, the gunner, and the quartermaster are the officers.' "'Did I gainsay it?' asked Sharkey, with an oath. "'You have miscalled us and mishandled us before the men, "'and we scarce know at the moment why "'we should risk our lives in fighting for the cabin and against the forecastle." "'Sharkey saw that something serious was in the wind.' He laid down his pistols, and leaned back in his chair with a flash of his yellow fangs. "'Nay, that is sad talk,' said he. "'The two stout fellows, who have emptied many a bottle and cut many a throat with me, should now fall out over nothing. I know you to be roaring boys who would go with me against the devil himself if I bid you. Let the steward bring cups and drown all unkindness between us.' It is no time for drinking, Captain Sharkey, said Martin. The men are holding council round the mainmast, and may be off at any minute. They mean mischief, Captain Sharkey, and we have come to warn you. Sharkey sprang for the brass-handled sword which hung from the wall. Sink them for rascals, he cried. When I have gutted one or two of them, they may hear reason. But the others barred his frantic way to the door. There are forty of them under the lead of Sweetlocks, the master, said Martin, and on the open deck they would surely cut you to pieces. Here within the cabin it may be that we can hold them off at the points of our pistols. He had hardly spoken when there came the tread of many heavy feet upon the deck. Then there was a pause with no sound but the gentle lipping of the water against the sides of the pirate vessel. Finally, a crashing blow, as from a pistol butt, fell upon the door, and an instant afterwards Sweetlocks himself, a tall dark man with a deep red birthmark blazing upon his cheek, strode into the cabin. His swaggering air sank somewhat as he looked 
into those pale and filmy eyes. "'Captain Sharkey,' said he, "'I come as a spokesman of the crew.' "'So I have heard, sweet locks," said the captain softly. "'I may live to rip you the length of your vest for this night's work.' "'That is as it may be, Captain Sharkey,' the master answered. But if you will look up, you will see that I have those at my back who will not see me mishandled. Cursed if we do, growled a deep voice from above, and glancing upwards, the officers in the cabin were aware of a line of fierce, bearded, sun-blackened faces looking down at them through the open skylight. Well, what would you have? asked Sharkey. Put it in words, man, and let us have an end of it. The men think, said Sweetlocks, that you are the devil himself, and that there will be no luck for them whilst they sail the sea in such company. Time was when we did our two or three craft a day, and every man had women and dollars to his liking. But now for a long week we have not raised a sail, and save for three beggarly sloops, have taken never a vessel since we passed the Bahama Bank. Also, they know that you killed Jack Bartholomew, the carpenter, by beating his head in with a bucket, so that each of us goes in fear of his life. Also, the rum has given out, and we are hard put to it for liquor. Also, you sit in your cabin whilst it is in the articles that you should drink and roar with the crew. For all these reasons, it has been this day and general meeting decreed... Sharkey had stealthily cocked a pistol under the table, so it may have been as well for the mutinous master that he never reached the end of his discourse, for even as he came to it there was a swift patter of feet upon the deck, and a ship lad, wild with his tidings, rushed into the room. "'A craft!' he yelled. "'A great craft! And close aboard us!' In a flash the quarrel was forgotten, and the pirates were rushing to quarters. Sure enough, surging slowly down before the gentle trade wind, a great full-rigged ship, with all sail set, was close beside them. It was clear that she had come from afar, and knew nothing of the ways of the Caribbean Sea, for she made no effort to avoid the low, dark craft which lay so close upon her bow, but blundered on as if her mere size would avail her. So daring was she, that for an instant the rovers, as they flew to loose the tackles of their guns and hoisted their battle lanterns, believed that a man of war had caught them napping. But at the sight of her bulging portless sides and merchant rig, a shout of exultation broke from amongst them, and in an instant they had swung round their foreyard, and darting alongside they had grappled with her and flung a spray of shrieking, cursing ruffians upon her deck. Half a dozen seamen of the night watch were cut down where they stood. The mate was felled by Sharkey and tossed overboard by Ned Galloway, and before the sleepers had time to set up in their berths, the vessel was in the hands of the pirates. The prize proved to be the full-rigged ship Portobello, Captain Hardy, master, bound from London to Kingston in Jamaica with a cargo of cotton goods and hoop iron. Having secured their prisoners, all huddled together in a dazed, distracted group, the pirates spread over the vessel in search of plunder, handing all that was found to the giant quartermaster, who, in turn, passed it over the side of the happy delivery and laid it under guard at the foot of her mainmast. The cargo was useless, but there were a thousand guineas in the ship's strong box, and there were some eight or ten passengers, three of them wealthy Jamaica merchants, all bringing home well-filled boxes from their London visit. When all the plunder was gathered, the passengers and crew were dragged to the waist, and under the cold smile of Sharkey, each in turn was thrown over the side, Sweetlocks standing by the rail and hamstringing them with his cutlass as they passed over, lest some strong swimmer should rise in judgment against them. A portly, gray-haired woman, the wife of one of the planters, was among the captives, but she also was thrust, screaming and clutching over the side. "'Mercy, ya hussy!' neighed Sharkey. "'You are surely a good twenty years too old for that!' The captain of the Portobello, a hale, blue-eyed, grey-beard, was the last upon the deck. 
He stood, a thick-set, resolute figure, in the glare of the lanterns, while Sharky bowed and smirked before him. "'One skipper should show courtesy to another,' said he, "'and sink me if Captain Sharky would be behind in good manners. I have held you to the last, as you see, where a brave man should be. So now, my bully, you have seen the end of them, and may step over with an easy mind.' "'So I shall, Captain Sharkey," said the old seaman, "'for I have done my duty so far as my power lay. "'But before I go over, I would say a word in your ear. "'If it be to soften me, you may save your breath. "'You have kept us waiting here for three days, "'and curse me if one of you shall live. "'Nay, it is to tell you what you should know. "'You have not yet found what is the true treasure of this ship.' Not found it? Sink me, but I will slice your liver, Captain Hardy, if you do not make good your words. Where is this treasure you speak of? It is not a treasure of gold, but it is a fair maid, which may be no less welcome. Where is she, then? And why is she not with the others? I will tell you why she is not with the others. She is the only daughter of the Count and Countess Ramirez, who are amongst those whom you have murdered. Her name is Inez Ramirez, and she is of the best blood of Spain, her father being governor of Chagre, to which he was now bound. It chanced that she was found to have formed an attachment, as maids will, to one far beneath her rank aboard the ship, so her parents, being people of great power, whose word is not to be gainsaid, constrained me to confine her close in a special cabin aft of my own. Here she was held straightly, all food being carried to her, and she allowed to see no one. This I tell you as a last gift, though why I should make it to you, I do not know, for indeed you are a most bloody rascal, and it comforts me in dying to think that you will surely be gallows meat in this world, and hell's meat in the next. At the words he ran to the rail, and vaulted over into the darkness, praying as he sank into the depths of the sea, that the betrayal of this maid might not be counted too heavily against his soul. The body of Captain Hardy had not yet settled upon the sand forty fathoms deep, before the pirates had rushed along the cabin gangway. There, sure enough, at the further end, was a barred door overlooked in their previous search. There was no key, but they beat it in with their gunstocks, whilst shriek after shriek came from within. In the light of their outstretched lanterns they saw a young woman, in the very prime and fullness of her youth, crouching in a corner, her unkempt hair hanging to the ground, her dark eyes glaring with fear, her lovely form straining away in horror from this inrush of savage blood-stained men. Rough hands seized her. She was jerked to her feet and dragged with scream on scream to where John Sharkey awaited her. He held the light long and fondly to her face. Then, laughing loudly, he bent forward and left his red handprint upon her cheek. "'Tis the rover's brand, lass, that he marks his use. Take her to the cabin and use her well. Now, hearties, get her under water and out to our luck once more. Within an hour the good ship Portobello had settled down to her doom, till she lay beside her murdered passengers upon the Caribbean sand, while the pirate bark, her deck littered with plunder, was heading northward in search of another victim. There was a carouse that night in the cabin of the Happy Delivery, at which three men drank deep. They were the captain, the quartermaster, and Baldy Stable, the surgeon, a man who had held the first practice in Charleston, until, misusing a patient, he fled from justice, and took his skill over to the pirates. A bloated, fat man he was, with a creased neck and a great shining scalp, which gave him his name. Sharkey had put for the moment all thought of the mutiny out of his head, knowing that no animal is fierce when it is overfed, and that whilst the plunder of the great ship was new to them, he need fear no trouble from his crew. He gave himself up, therefore, to the wine and the riot, shouting and roaring with his boon companions. All three were flushed and mad, ripe for any devilment, 
When the thought of the woman crossed the pirate's evil mind, he yelled to the negro steward that he should bring her on the instant. Inez Ramirez had now realized it all, the death of her father and mother, and her own position in the hands of their murderers. Yet calmness had come with the knowledge, and there was no sign of terror in her proud dark face as she was led into the cabin, but rather a strange firm set of the mouth and an exultant gleam of the eyes, like one who sees great hopes in the future. She smiled at the pirate captain as he rose and seized her by the waist. "'For God, this is the lass of spirit!' cried Sharkey, passing his arm round her. "'She was born to be a rover's bride. Come, my bird, and drink to our better friendship.' "'Article six, hiccuffed the doctor. All bona rovis in common.' "'Aye, we will hold you to that, Captain Sharkey,' said Galloway. "'It is so writ in Article Six. "'I will cut the man into ounces who comes betwixt us,' cried Sharkey, "'as he turned his fish-like eyes from one to the other. "'Nay, lass, the man is not born that will take you from John Sharkey. "'Sit here upon my knee and place your arm round me so. "'Sink me if she has not learned to love me at sight. "'Tell me, my pretty,' why you are so mishandled and laid in the bilboes aboard yonder craft the woman shook her head and smiled no english no english she lisped she had drunk off the bumper of wine which sharkey held to her and her dark eyes gleamed more brightly than before sitting on sharkey's knee her arm encircled his neck and her hand toyed with his hair his ear his cheek even the strange quartermaster and the hardened surgeon felt a horror as they watched her but sharkey laughed in his joy curse me if she is not a lass of metal he cried as he pressed her to him and kissed her unresisting lips but a strange intent look of interest had come into the surgeon's eyes as he watched her and his face set rigidly as if a fearsome thought had entered his mind there stole a gray pallor over his bull face, mottling all the red of the tropics and the flush of the wine. "'Look at her hand, Captain Sharkey,' he cried. "'For the Lord's sake, look at her hand!' Sharkey stared down at the hand which had fondled him. It was of a strange dead pallor, with a yellow shiny web betwixt the fingers. All over it was a white fluffy dust, like the flower of a new-baked loaf. It lay thick on Sharkey's neck and cheek. With a cry of disgust, he flung the woman from his lap. But in an instant, with a wild cat bound and a scream of triumphant malice, she had sprung at the surgeon, who vanished, yelling under the table. One of her clawing hands grasped Galloway by the beard, but he tore himself away and, snatching a pike, held her off from him, as she gibbered and mewed with the blazing eyes of a maniac. The black steward had run in on the sudden turmoil, and among them they forced the mad creature back into a cabin and turned the key upon her. Then the three sank panting into their chairs and looked with eyes of horror upon each other. The same word was in the mind of each, but Galloway was the first to speak it. A leper, he cried. She has us all. Curse her. Not me, said the surgeon. She never laid her finger on me. For that matter, cried Galloway, it was but my beard that she touched. I will have every hair of it off before morning. Dotes that we were, the surgeon shouted, beating his head with his hand. Tainted or no, we shall never know a moment's peace till the year is up and the time of danger past. For God, that merchant skipper has left his mark on us, and pretty fools we were to think that such a maid would be quarantined for the cause he gave. It is easy to see now that her corruption broke forth in the journey, and that save throwing her over, they had no choice but to board her up until they should come to some port with a lazarette. Sharkey had sat leaning back in his chair with a ghastly face while he listened to the surgeon's words. He mopped himself with his red handkerchief and wiped away the fatal dust with which he was smeared. "'What of me?' he croaked. "'What say you, Baldy Stable? Is there a chance for me? 
curse you for a villain. Speak out, or I will drub you within an inch of your life. And that inch also. Is there a chance for me, I say? But the surgeon shook his head. Captain Sharkey, said he, it would be an ill deed to speak you false. The taint is on you. No man on whom the leper scales have rested is ever clean again. Sharkey's head fell forward on his chest, and he sat motionless, stricken by this great and sudden horror, looking with his smoldering eyes into his fearsome future. Softly the mate and the surgeon rose from their places, and, stealing out from the poisoned air of the cabin, came forth into the freshness of the early dawn, with a soft, scent-laden breeze in their faces, and the first red feathers of cloud catching the earliest gleam of the rising sun as it shot its golden rays over the palm-clad ridges of distant Hispaniola. That morning a second council of the rovers was held at the base of the mainmast, and a deputation chosen to see the captain. They were approaching the after-cabins when Sharkey came forth, the old devil in his eyes, and his bandolier with a pair of pistols over his shoulder. "'Sink you all for villains!' he cried. "'Would you dare to cross my hoss? "'Stand out, sweet locks, and I will lay you open. "'Here, Galloway, Martin, Foley, stand by me, "'and lash the dogs to their kennel.' "'But his officers had deserted him, "'and there was none to come to his aid. "'There was a rush of the pirates. "'One was shot through the body, "'but an instant afterwards Sharkey had been seized "'and was triced to his own mainmast.' His filmy eyes looked round from face to face, and there was none who felt the happier for having met them. "'Captain Sharkey,' said Sweetlocks, "'you have mishandled many of us, and you have now pistoled John Masters, besides killing Bartholomew, the carpenter, by braining him with a bucket. All this might have been forgiven you, in that you have been our leader for years, and that we have signed articles to serve under you while the voyage lasts.' But now we have heard of this bona roba on board, and we know that you are poisoned to the marrow, and that while you rot there will be no safety for any of us, but that we shall all be turned into filth and corruption. Therefore, John Sharkey, we rovers of the happy delivery, in council assembled, have decreed that while there be yet time, before the plague spreads, you shall be set adrift in a boat, to find such a fate as fortune may be pleased to send you. John Sharkey said nothing, but slowly circling his head, he cursed them all with his baleful gaze. The ship's dinghy had been lowered, and he, with his hands still tied, was dropped into it on the bite of a rope. Cast her off, cried Sweetlocks. Nay, hold hard a moment, Master Sweetlocks, shouted one of the crew. What of the wench? Is she to bide aboard and poison us all? Send her off with her mate, cried another, and the rovers roared their approval. Driven forth at the end of pikes, the girl was pushed towards the boat. With all the spirit of Spain in her rotting body, she flashed triumphant glances on her captors. Peros, peros ingleses, lepro, lepro, she cried in exultation as they thrust her over into the boat. "'Good luck, Captain. God speed you on your honeymoon!' cried a chorus of mocking voices, as the painter was unloosed, and the happy delivery, running full before the trade wind, left the little boat astern, a tiny dot upon the vast expanse of the lonely sea. Extract from the log of H.M. Fifty-Gun Ship, Hecate in her cruise off the American Main. January 26, 1721. This day, the junk having become unfit for food, and five of the crew down with scurvy, I ordered that we send two boats ashore of the northwestern point of Hispaniola to seek for fresh fruit, and perchance shoot some of the wild oxen with which the island abounds. 7 p.m. The boats have returned with good store of green stuff, and two bullocks. Mr. Woodruff, the master, reports that near the landing place at the edge of the forest was found the skeleton of a woman, clad in European dress, of such short as to show that she may have been a person of quality. Her head had been crushed by a great stone, 
which lay beside her. Hard by was a grass hut, and signs that a man had dwelt therein for some time, as was shown by charred wood, bones, and other traces. There is a rumor upon the coast that Sharky, the bloody pirate, was marooned in these parts last year, but whether he has made his way into the interior, or whether he has been picked up by some craft, there is no means of knowing. If he be once again afloat, then I pray that God send him under our guns.'